And then you have these two situations where you've talked about that are like panic zones. Were you able to learn in the in that moment and was it valuable or was it something that hindered your ability to learn? Um, definitely with the knife incident, I was not learning. That was a direct impulse. Mm-hmm. And um, I was either going to freeze and I don't know what would have happened or I was going to react. Mm-hmm. And I think when you react, you're not learning a reaction it can only come from what you've already learned. Welcome to the Teach Bigger Podcast. I'm Chris Pratt. I'm Tyler Lamond. And we're glad that you're tuning in with us today. So question, I want you to think about the scenario that I'm going to give you, Tyler. And I want you to, on a scale of 1 to 10, tell me how comfortable you are with this idea. Okay. Okay, so first scenario is this. It's raining outside. You're going to be stuck in the house all day. Okay. Now, is it like a storm? Is it like, are we talking like Hurricane Harvey out there? No, no, no. It's just raining. It's, uh, it's you know, it's not a good day to go out. So you decide to just chill in the house. So right? just like a, a light little summer rain. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Depends on what state you're in, but yeah. And I'm probably going to fall asleep on the couch. Exactly. So if you were to rate your comfort zone from a one to a 10, one is like, I'm super chill. 10 is like, I think I might die. Where would you be? I'd probably be about a one. Nice. Well, that's good that you're not going to be at a 10, but all right, good. All right. So I would agree. That's, that's kind of where I would be. So let's, let's take it up a level and ask this scenario. Let's say that you're working for a company and your boss comes to you and says, over the course of the next month, I need you to travel to several different states. And you're going to be traveling by yourself and you're going to go make all these different business visits and it's going to last about a month. So... Boom. Where are you now? I don't know. That's that's a little bit of a tougher one because I've I've only flown out of the state like a few times. Mm-hmm. And ooh, and one time I did miss my flight, so that was super stressful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it was it was really good for me. So I'm I would say, and I love to travel. So I would say that um I would probably be sitting somewhere about five to six and it, it might go up the closer I get to the gate just because I would be worried about missing my flight. All right. How, how do you feel about having to be by yourself and like navigating through different places on your own? That would, that would definitely be pretty uncomfortable just because I don't know the place. And, um, ever since I missed that one flight and I've only ever missed one flight my entire life. And that was when I was 17, but it was enough to like, put this fear into me. So now I'm always afraid that I'm going to like miss a flight. So it, um, yeah, it would, I would, I would definitely feel like I would be pretty uncomfortable, but it wouldn't be enough to stop me. Like, I mean, if it was a directive and like I was told to do it, then I would do it. And I would probably come out on top a little bit better because I'd done it. All right. So do you feel like it would cause stress for you or is it just uncomfortable? Well, I mean, I think any type of uncomfortability is, is some form of, uh, Stress. I think stress itself is uncomfortable. Okay, agreed, agreed. All right, so last scenario here, thinking again on our little scale of 1 to 10. 1, totally chill. 10, I think I might die. Um, comfort zone. What if you had to jump out of the airplane? <laughs> like you have to. For whatever reason, that can be up to your imagination. Why would I jump out of a perfectly good airplane? Well, but you have to. Was so it on fire? I, I'm not going to give you that <laughs> scenario because, you know, I don't, I don't want to. Do I have a parachute? Right, and, well... <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but let's just say you have, okay, yes, you have a parachute. Okay, you I have, have a parachute. I have a parachute. Are you a skydiver? Uh, I've always wanted to go skydiving. That doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have to jump out of an airplane and you're not a skydiver. Where are you on a one to 10? I'm probably wondering if I'm going to die. Right, I think I'm at a 14. <laughs> 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 All right, so. Obviously, different scenarios and different situations take us in and out of comfort zones, right? Yeah. I mean, for most of us, having a chill inside, that's like, that's not out of our comfort zone at all. That's what we long for, okay? 
Um, and then, you know, you can move up and down the scale from there. So today what we want to do is we're going to talk about these comfort zones and the stress that they cause. And then we want to determine how does this affect our teaching and the learning dynamic in our classroom. Okay. So I think we've kind of established, you know, if we just give it the scale of one to 10, right? So I would say low stress, you could probably say is from like one to two or so, maybe to three. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so then if we look at the other end of that spectrum, you have high stress, okay, way out of your comfort zone would be like nine to 10. Okay. So then we have this big area in the middle, which is, you know, three to eight. Okay. So that being said, I want to kind of ask you, Tyler, where do you think, well, what do you think is, is the effect of those comfort levels on your ability to learn from the situation? But so, so how much learning takes place when you're at that one and two comfortability, like you're super comfortable and then how much learning can take place there in that really big middle. And then whenever you get to the panic zone, nine and 10, how much learning actually takes place? Okay. Well, one to two where it's relaxed, there's, there's no learning taking place because there's no engagement. There's no, I mean, maybe I'm like reading something, maybe I'm watching TV, but there's nothing that's, that's positively engaging. That's pushing me to, to do something. Mm -hmm. Um, three to eight, I would say that's probably where the, the learning takes place. Like that just rem like reminds me of like my first year of high school, like how I was really nervous about it. And then like, um, like being around all those older, older kids and things of that nature. Um, how I really had to push myself to, to be there. And then ultimately like, that's still something I have to do now. Like, um, when I moved to, uh, to, to, you know, I went to college and stuff. I was the only person there and I didn't have a lot of friends for, you know, the very beginning. So I really had to push myself to go out and like meet new people. Mm -hmm. So, and maybe I didn't necessarily learn, but I definitely grew as a person doing those types of things. And even now, like as I, I live by myself, I, um, still make sure I push myself to like, just go do literally anything because I know that if I don't push myself to go do something, then, then I'm never going to, going to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think nine to 10. Have you, let me ask this. Have you ever been in a nine to 10 situation? Um, yeah. Can you tell me? So there was this one time we were in my friend's camper and we were all joking around and um my friend's little brother has uh I hadn't seen him in, in quite a long time and um when he was younger he had a bit of an anger problem mm -hmm. and he didn't know how to like cope with his anger but like that was like 5 years ago from the day of this event and um I th I figured that he had grown up a lot more and uh, anyway, he got mad at us because we made some joke or something. I don't know. We were all teenagers. And uh, he pulled a knife on us. Mm. And um, Not the I, right crowd, Tyler. Not <laughs> the right crowd. <laughs> <laughs> well, he pulled a knife on us in that um, I think when you get to that 9 or 10, like that fight or flight mm -hmm. thing happens. Like you're either going to cave or you're not. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, we were in a camper, so it was like tough, like close quarters. So I just like took his arm and I – hit it against the wall and his, the knife fell on the ground and like, you know, I stomped on it. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I mean, I went out and like got his dad and stuff like that. And you know, I mean, it was, it was a whole like ordeal, mm -hmm. but, um, um, yeah, that was, um, really kind of made my heart race a little bit. And then I guess another, uh, another scenario where like, um, I guess there's two other ones, but I won't share the other one. Um, when I, when I missed that flight, mm -hmm. when I was a little kid, um, I, I'm, well, I wasn't that little. I was about 17. I was still pretty young, <laughs> right. but, uh, I missed it and I'd never flown before. Mm -hmm. And I missed it because I asked one of the flight attendants who was like working the, the desk or whatever, if I was in the right spot and she didn't give me the time of day mm -hmm. and she just said yes. So like, here I am sitting and, um, 
like very, I, I was in, uh, where was I? I was in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. And like I was really nervous and I was getting even more nervous because I was the only person at this gate and I did not know where I needed to be. And like uh, shortly after she told me I was in the right spot, she like left. So now there's no one at the desk and I'm like, okay, well, what do I do? Do I like go out and adventure out and try to find somebody mm-hmm. and find something or am I in the right place? And like, I'm just early. Like I feel like my flight starts in like 10 minutes. I feel like I should have already boarded and, um, I don't know like what's going on. And then like, um, after about 10 minutes had passed when my flight should have gone, I went and I found somebody. Cause then I was now I was self-conscious. I was like, is this next person going to tell me the truth? Cause like now I'm a 17 year old boy who has no money. Like my luggage, I don't know where it's at. You know, like what's going on? Um, how am I going to get back home? And um, I found somebody and they, they told me what to do and, and how I could reroute my flights. And, and then, then I was even more nervous because I had to call my parents to let them know that I missed the flight mm-hmm. and it cost my dad even more money mm-hmm. to get me back home. Um, so that was a, that was a very, I think that was probably maybe the, the knife instant incident was, a panic moment because it happened like that. Mm -hmm. The flight moment where I missed my flight was a panic that lasted Mm -hmm. because there was a long period of time of uncertainty with the knife. I like knocked it out of his hand. It was over. It was done. Like maybe there was going to be some punishments that were going to happen to me or whatever, but that wasn't going to be anything close to like what he could have done. And then with the flight, it was like, a huge amount of unknown that lasted for like two or three hours. Like when is my flight going to get here? Like, because um, I think I had a cell phone at that time. I can't remember. That was a, a long time. That was a while ago. Um, but like, I know I definitely didn't have my phone charger if I did have a cell phone. Cause that was, that was before I uh, would keep stuff like that. So I, I remember just the feeling of uncertainty mm-hmm. of not knowing what was going to happen. And then knowing that I was totally alone and that I had no way of getting back or that, I mean, I knew I was going to get back, but it was like, how is this going to happen? Like if I can't get a hold of anybody, you know what I mean? Right. Right. Okay. So if we kind of take those ideas and then we kind of think about learning Mm -hmm. and I mean, I think with every situation, no matter where you are, one to 10, if you kind of sit back and reflect, you know, after the fact of whatever's going on, you can always learn a lesson, right? Yeah. But what I want to talk about is like in that moment, were you receptive to learning or was it beyond that? So in other words, you know, you've got your comfortability of being indoors, nothing to do. Okay. Are you primed for learning? Right. And then you have the scenario of traveling on your own. Is that set you up for learning? And then you have these two situations where you've talked about that are like panic zones. Were you able to learn in the, in that moment and was it valuable or was it something that hindered your ability to learn? Um, definitely with the knife incident, I was not learning. That was a direct impulse. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was either going to freeze and I don't know what would have happened or I was going to react And I think when you react, you're not learning. A reaction, it can only come from what you've already learned Mm -hmm. to what you, what you think you've already like programmed in you. And I I don't know how that falls into with the fight or flight. I don't know how you can program yourself to fight instead of flight. I I don't know that kind of gets into the nature versus nurture, I guess, like what's, what's already in you and what do you have to learn? And then kind of things like that. And then with the flight thing, I definitely was not in a learning state of mind. I, I definitely, I was only cause when you're, when you're panicked, you're only focusing on one thing mm-hmm. and that is the problem. You're only focusing on the problem and it's not like you're focusing on the problem in the sense of like, Hey, this is a math problem. I have to sit down. Let's figure out, come up with some strategies. It's like, this is a huge problem that could pretty much directly affect my life forever. Mm -hmm. So you can't sit there and, and come up with a plan. Now I did 
come up playing it since I was 17. My plan was immediately to call my parents. Right. But I definitely was not coming up with, uh, I, it was hard to come up with a plan because I was scared. Mm -hmm. I was, um, I wasn't thinking straight. And uh, I mean, granted I was also 17, but like my parents like came up with it or, or whatever. And now that I remember, I do remember having a cell phone because like we did a lot of like, I called and then hung up and then got information and, Mm -hmm. and gave it back to them and stuff like that. But that was definitely before the age of smartphones. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, I was definitely more of a, um, like take care of me state than I was of trying to figure out and, and trying to do something now looking back on it because I lived through it. Mm -hmm. I do think I became better from it. But then again, like, I mean, how much better did I grow from that one experience? Cause I mean, as I said earlier, like I'm a little traumatized every time I go to a flight, especially like I do not like to fly by myself because I want somebody there to fall back on in case something bad happens. Now I'm trying to like, cause like I, I'm probably going to uh, fly out in November to Indianapolis for a big conference. So um, I'll probably be okay because like now I have a job, like I have some type of security right. to be like, if something bad happened, I'll be okay. Like, and then also because I've already have that prior experience, like the worst scenario has already happened. Mm-hmm. I missed my flight. Right. So like other than like, other bad things that can happen on an airplane. Like there's very few other things that can top that can top that, that what other than threatening my life. You know what I mean? Right. 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 Okay. So given the airplane example, okay. What was your response to the people involved, whether it was the flight attendant or the, the person working the counter or like your experience at the airport, your parents, like, how did that affect you? Did you become angry? Did you become resentful? Like, yes. how, how was the response there? I was definitely extremely angry at the, um, at the flight attendant because when I asked her the first time if I was in the right spot, now there's two different ladies. The first lady I asked if I was in the right spot, I knew she wasn't giving me the time of day. I knew that she wasn't paying attention to me. I knew that she just glanced at my ticket and she just was like, hmm, yeah, you're here. Mm-hmm. Like, I knew that that was the case, but there was nobody else. So then, um, and I think that happens a lot with people is when like, when somebody wrongs them, they go after whoever that is like students. Like if a teacher wrongs a student, then that student now thinks all teachers are bad. Right. And same thing with like kids, like, like if a parent wrongs a a kid, like with abuse or something like that, it's now in their head that all parents are bad. What are you talking about? Parents don't do that. Your brother and sister don't. You mean you don't get like thrown into the the garage and beaten? Right. You know what I mean. So I was definitely <clears throat> extremely mad, um, and I I remember I remember going and talking to the the next lady, and and being mad at me like, well, you know, I talked to so and so, and she didn't even help me like, da, 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 da. and um, now luckily that flight attendant she was a much better person and she was like, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Like, I mean, just because you're a teenager doesn't mean you, blah, blah, blah. and she like, she did make me feel better and kind of talked me down. And then when I talked to my, um, my dad, a lot of people don't know this, but my dad always says he has two sons, boy wonder and boy blunder. Mm-hmm. And I'm not wonder boy. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really nervous to call my dad to let him know, because this was just like another mess up that I had done. Mm-hmm. Another, another, like whatever in the, in the long line of list of things that I've done. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, he's my dad. So he was very like, let's take care of you first. But I didn't hear the end of that mm-hmm. for a very, very long time. Mm-hmm. And that's not nice when like, that was kind of a traumatic experience. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I was kind of thinking about one of my major uncomfort zones and mm-hmm. kind of putting in relationship to what we're talking about. And so it's kind of a weird story and could probably, I don't know if it's a great story here, but okay. So whenever I had just entered middle school and so I was probably like in eighth, well, I guess I was in eighth grade because I was getting ready for high school. So I was in eighth grade and we had moved into a new house and it was going to be one of my first times to 
kind of have a room all to myself kind of thing. And the way our house was set up, like my room was going to be downstairs next to the garage. And the rest of the family was like off in a different section of the house. So it was kind of like I was alone. And so I had quite a bit. I was, it was definitely out of my comfort zone because, you know, like that was that was a stretch for me growing up. And um, so I was excited but nervous, right? And so that that's setting it up to be like a really cool learning experience because like I can do this on my own, like there's nothing to be afraid of kind of thing. Um, but next to the garage, our cat, which I think this is why I don't like cats to this day. But I thought you were allergic to cats. Well, I am allergic to cats. Are too. you sure you're allergic? Yeah. Or do you just say you're <laughs> right. allergic? Like, I, no, I really am. But um, we did have a cat at that time, and the cat was in the garage, and the garage was closed. And so I don't, I don't want to be graphic, but I don't know if you've ever been around a cat whenever it's um, in heat, but that's a very <laughs> <laughs> awkward experience, and they make very strange noises. And so in the middle of the night, this cat starts making these wild animal noises. And I've never heard that before. And so literally, like, my anxiety level went through the roof because I can't go to sleep because there's this cat. And to me, it doesn't sound like a cat. It sounds like that there's possibly a bear or some other large Mm -hmm. animal in the garage. And so I wake up the next morning and I, I tell my parents, you know, like, I think there's a wild animal in the garage, you know, because we, we kind of live like in the woods. <laughs> so it was possible. Yeah. And and so my dad took advantage of this situation <laughs> and because he knew exactly what had happened. And so he comes and we're, we're standing outside in the driveway. And this was we didn't really have a garage door opener at the time. So you had to manually lift open. I hope that doesn't make me sound too old, but you had to manually <laughs> open the garage door. So he decided to sling it open and then start screaming at the top of his lungs and sling it back down. (laughs) Right. Just like, you know, like he was going to panic as a joke. I think I peed (laughs) because my worst fear was coming true. Right. And so I remember having my cat in my hands at this time because like, I'm like trying to protect the cat because I think there's an animal in the garage and this cat literally jumps up on my head and starts clawing me. Right. And so then my dad just rolls on the ground laughing because he thinks it's so funny what he's done to me. And in that moment, this is not a learning moment. (laughs) Right. Like this is I really don't like this situation. And in the moment, I like I'm shut down. I don't trust my dad. I don't want to learn anything like I resent him right now. Like, you know, and I mean, obviously, Mm -hmm. I don't feel that way anymore. But that was so far out of my comfort zone and brought so much stress that I shut down and I was in total panic mode. Right. Yeah. So I I think what we're kind of gathering and, and I mean, I'm sure the listeners have their own situations and they've probably been thinking of things as we've been talking, but I think that it's kind of clear that quality learning isn't taking place when we are so far out of our comfort zones or so stressed out, you know? And Obviously, if there's a really low level engagement, it's not going to happen. So for our purposes in this conversation, we realize that there's this area that that's kind of like a a medium stakes stress. Right. So like whenever you're placed out of your comfort zone, it does cause a little stress. Right. Yeah. But I think one thing to realize is like when you're at that low stress, like a one to two, three, something like that, there's really not a lot of growth taking place because you're not challenged. Yeah. Right. And then whenever you get to that medium stress level, you find that there's a lot of struggle involved. Like, for example, traveling. Okay. There's struggle involved. Like you have to navigate, you have to talk to people you don't know, you have to trust people like there there's struggle in that, but it's achievable. And in the end, this strengthens you and produce results because then you feel like, hey, I know how to travel. And next time I'm going to do this differently. And I, I'm going to have this plan or I'm going to take advantage of my time this way. And like you, you start to learn from the experience. But then whenever you get to that high stress, it's like undeniable failure. Like you feel like you can't overcome the situation, no matter how big or small. And you know, this is so different for everybody because what may stress one person out is nothing to another person. And so it's, it's like there's a really big spectrum here. But that, that kind of stress, it produces like fear or insecurity, it's overwhelming and it's discouraging and that produces negative effects and hinders progress. So I think what we've got to realize as educators 
is that both for ourselves and our students, we have to design opportunities for our students to struggle because if, if there's no struggle, they're not going to learn. But in, the, in our effort to design those opportunities, we can't take them so far mm-hmm. that it creates so far out of their comfort zone and it creates such a high level of stress that they shut down and grow bitter or resentful or give up or don't want to do the, the uh, assignments or activities. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just about to say um, a few years ago, like I, I went to the music for all camp mm-hmm. and um, that was, a, that was up at ball state. I think it was in Indianapolis. I can't quite remember, but um, I flipped there by myself mm-hmm. and uh, I was like in my early twenties or so uh, it was, I guess it was further back than I think it was. But um, I remember thinking like, okay, like I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to do this. Like it was all planned out, and it was the it was really the first time I had flown by my. I had flown since I was seventeen, but I'd flown with other people. This was the first time that I, because I flew up there and I was supposed to meet the shuttle and they were supposed to drive me and then like all of these things, and so this was the first time and I was like, okay, well I'm not gonna mess up. And I think this was like a really huge moment for me and help me kind of get over like my fear of like missing the flight and that because a lot of things can go wrong when you um when you're traveling and um I would say that I stayed at an eight if not a seven and a half Mm -hmm. for all five days that I was over there Mm -hmm. and I know that I was there at that that level because even when I was inside my like my back was sweaty (laughs) Like, like, I don't want to be gross or anything, but like, I remember like getting off the plane and just like, you know, that feeling you get that, that clammy feeling where like, you feel like you've been sweating, but now you're dry. Like I felt like that the entire trip Mm -hmm. and I just ignored it. And what, one of the things that uh, really helped me and, uh, and this could be a huge thing for you. Like if you've ever had like a panic moment Mm -hmm. and maybe it's traumatized you or maybe you're trying to trying to maybe it traumatizes you and you're trying to turn it into a learning experience, even if it happened years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd never been to ball state before. I have no idea what the campus layout is. There was high school students that were there and there was this one high school student and I don't remember his name, but he was, man, he was lost. He was, he was lost little duck and uh, he didn't know where to go. And I looked at him and I, all I saw was like the 17 year old me mm-hmm. at the airport. And I was like, I was like, Hey man, like we're supposed to be. And he's like, Oh, I'm supposed to be at the auditorium. Like we're supposed to be getting orientation and talking about this. And like, I don't know where it's at. And I was like, well, you know, I don't know where it's at either. Let's go look for it. Mm-hmm. So at least he wasn't by himself. And then that really like, I mean, you know, we, we found it cause we were supposed to both, 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 both supposed to be in the same spot. And, um, that really was like, that really kind of helped me get past it and turn the panic into a, uh, a learning area but i'll also say that like that like it was a choice for me to to go to music for all Mm -hmm. like i mean i was given an opportunity but i didn't have to go no one sat there and told me that i had to go so i went for multiple reasons one i knew it was going to be a good experience and i and i was trying to learn something Mm -hmm. and then two i knew it was going to be a good experience for me personally as a person to grow to overcome this like irrational little phobia, this irrational little fear. But the only way that was going to happen is if I made myself do it. Mm. If I invested into myself. So you had to create an environment that produced a struggle in you so that you could accomplish it. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. So if we bring this to the classroom, then I, I think let's do this little activity together. And like, you know, I can ask you this and then maybe, you know, I can reflect on it too, but I want you to think, and and for our listeners do the same, think of some activities in your class that you do that maybe put students into these three comfort zones. So like what activity do you do in class that puts kids, the majority of kids into like a one to three, like super chill activity where they're not really growing. I'm sure you don't ever do that, Tyler, because all (laughs) your kids are always challenged and so, yeah. so t- tell me about that. Like, well, that's you, easy. You just let them like? play on their phones. Right, right, right. <laughs> the com- hey, hey um, the, some teachers tell me that there's something called a, a, a free day. 
uh, and uh, apparently a free day right. is where students come in and they do nothing. Okay. And they play on their phones and they're not engaged. And it makes my life really, really hard because then they come into my class and wonder why Mr. Lamont doesn't have a free day. Right. So, you know, if you've been given free days, we just want to give you some free advice. <laughs> Make sure that the kids are always engaged in learning. Yes, all the time. You know, it's it's funny because uh, when the sixth grader beginner band was going to go on their very first trip, the buses were late by like two hours. Okay, that sounds like a good first trip. That's a terrible thing <laughs> because now I have this room full of 300 sixth graders. Right. And like... I, I had just got them calm. I had just calmed them all down. They were all focused. They were sitting up tall. They were focused on me. They were tracking me. And then I get word, uh, someone like whispers in my ear and they're like, the buses are late. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Because if I let them do whatever they want, this is 300 kids. Right. That's like a town. So what was your comfort zone? My my comfort zone was prob- probably, well, because I knew exactly what to do. Right. So it was probably about a seven. Okay. So, but my so point this is a good learning experience right here. You know, so yeah. my, my point is, is what I did is I let them ask me personal questions. I mean, I reserved the right to determine what's too personal. Right. But I mean, cause those kids are like, man, like, right. like, where do you live? Like, what's the coolest song you've ever played? Like, man, right, right, you know, right. things like that. And, uh, so like, it was like free time, I guess you can't see I'm doing air quotes, right. but it was like free time, I guess. But really they were all engaged and I was the one who's still in control of the entire room. Yeah. So, but that was, um, that was pretty low. So do you feel like there was a lot of learning that took place? Um, maybe just about your personal life. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> I guess about that. I guess the learning thing was, is that, um, cause I had other teachers who didn't believe in doing stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I think it was learning for, for me and for them to show that like, all you have to do is make sure the kids are engaged right? and then everything in life will be okay. Right. Because they stayed engaged on me, and it lasted two hours, mm-hmm. and then they got on the bus, and they were they were not crazy. They were, I mean, normal little sixth graders. Right. Do you know what that really means? What that you like to talk about yourself? I do like to talk about myself <laughs> a lot. Favorite subject. It is my favorite subject. Okay, so then let's think about an activity that gives that middle range, like you know, five to seven, somewhere around there. What's something that you do that causes a comfort zone or a stress level of about five to seven. So this would be the place where students are really engaged and they are learning, but there's struggle involved. So can you think of something that you might do? Yeah, I would think about some type of, um, some type of group activity Mm -hmm. that's going to, I don't want to say isolate, but, uh, it, they're, they don't have the comfort of being of hiding in the entire class. Mm-hmm. Now they have to hide in a group of four. Mm-hmm. So maybe the kid is still hiding, but maybe he's contributing. Maybe he's not. I don't know. But, uh, well, I mean, I would know because I would go over there and find out. Mm-hmm. But um, he they are now in a group of four instead of 24, or 34, or 44. Mm-hmm. And um, so it takes down that comfortability. And then you give that person a task. Right, because they can't hide anymore. Yeah, because now they're okay. responsible. Even if that task is like, hey, you're going to be the timekeeper. So now yeah. they're being forced to collaborate and talk to. And Okay, so yeah, I think that's a great example. So like whenever you allow your students to collaborate with structure, then that's going to put them in a position where there's going to be some struggle because they're going to have to learn to work together. They're going to have to come up with solutions to the problems that you give them. But also they're learning a lot from that and they can overcome that. It is achievable. Yeah. Right? Okay, so can you think of maybe something that you have done where it took the kids all the way to a 9 or 10 where they just shut down and there wasn't oh, learning yes. taking place? It is the craziest thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it's really easy in this day and age because of social media and everything. All you have to do is make a kid stand up and speak in front of the entire class, and they'll shut down, like, super fast. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy. Um, I was giving a chair test. Mm-hmm. They had to play the B-flat scale. And I was trying to teach them like, you know, normal concert etiquette of like, if you're going to play for somebody, you stand up, you state your name and you state what you're going to play and then you play it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they were like, some of them were like giving jokes. They're like, and I was like, yeah, it's going to be 10 points off your grade if you don't do it. And they're like, oh, well, I'm just, I'll just take the L. I'll just take the L. I was like, oh, okay. Well, how about this? 
75 points off your grade if you do not stand up, state your name, and what you're about to play. Mm-hmm. I had two girls take it. Mm. And I was like, you're, I was like, you're literally not – you're like, you're going to take 75 points off a major test grade just because you don't want to stand up and say your name. Mm. And they didn't even respond. They just shook their head and they're like, yeah. See, and that's so interesting because what's easy for one kid is, you know, for some kids in your class, they may have been a one or two, yeah, a zero maybe. But then those kids were at a nine or a 10. And so as educators, we have to be very sensitive to the spectrum in our class and realize where different kids are with activities and that's where differentiation becomes so important mm-hmm. because we've got to make sure that they stay engaged and learning and they're not shutting down. Yeah. You know, I heard a, a Jerry Seinfeld, um, stand up comedy routine one time and he, he brought up the point that the number one fear of people in America, like the number one fear is public speaking. Yeah. And he said, number two is death. He said, people would rather die than speak in public. And so that's just such an interesting. That's so true. I there's there is a veteran teacher that I work with right now. She's been teaching for over I don't know probably forty years or something like that. Yeah. And in a professional development, she had to stand up and share. Mm-hmm. And when she stood up, she was like, "The thing I learned today was da 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 da." And then she like sat back da- sat back down, and I'm like, "Like that's insane! Like I've seen you stand in front of hundreds of students, get them quiet, do all these things, but you put this." veteran teacher this person who knows what she's doing right in front of her colleagues and ask her to speak and say something boom she's done right and then uh just subsequently i would just like to uh state that um i was not doing 75 points off to embarrass those students i was just doing it so that way i was trying to make a point because all the kids were going to opt out because it was only 10 points. Right. They were taking the easy way out. They were taking the easy way out, and I didn't want them to take the easy way out. Okay. All right. And those students did not fail. Well, that's that's good. Thanks for reminding. I'm glad that you brought them to success. (laughs) So, all right. So, then where where do we feel like, and you as a listener, where do you feel the ideal stress level or comfort zone for deep learning is? Like, if we gave it a number. Okay. And it's going to be different for everybody. You kind of just view it on your spectrum. So, I mean, I personally look at it about, Maybe a six or a seven. I would say six or seven, somewhere around there. Yeah. So, so here's kind of our aim then. And as we kind of close out this episode, something to kind of consider is as you're designing learning opportunities for your students, you need to kind of check this spectrum and think to yourself, you know, am I in that, that area where I'm going to pull my kids out of their comfort zone? There's going to be a little stress involved because there's struggle but everything's attainable. We have to guard ourselves that we're not keeping our activities so comfortable that kids don't engage in them. Mm -hmm. But then on the flip side of that, we have to be careful that we don't make our activities so stressful or so out of people's comfort zones that they shut down and then it's ineffective. So I think that moving forward, one of the things for us to really consider as, as really outstanding educators is that comfort zones matter and stress level matters in the classroom. And, you know, it matters in your personal life too. And so we want to make sure that we're constantly designing opportunities for ourselves and for students that challenge us. You know, a lot of times as teachers, you know, we kind of feel like, oh, I'm just, I'm kind of stagnant right now. I'm kind of stale. I don't have a Going lot of Going through enthusiasm. the motions. Yeah. So, so design an activity for yourself that's going to put you out of your comfort zone enough that you know you can achieve it. I, yeah, I would say that your whole life, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe only like 10, 7% out of your entire day needs to be from a zero to a two. Right, because you need some times where you, yeah. you relax and there's downtime. And maybe in your class, too, mm-hmm. you need a moment where there's a brain break or a debrief, and that's okay. And I think that maybe like 50% of your day of everyday life needs to be between like a three and a five. Mm-hmm. And then like leaving like 30 or, or 40% to be like that seven and eight. Because like it would be tough to be at that seven and eight right. every single day. Right. And at all moments of the day, but if you're constantly pushing yourself and that's another thing that we, we didn't really talk about, but, um, if I had to go fly again by myself, 
I wouldn't be at an eight all day right. for five days. Right. Because I learned from it. I learned from it. That's I would de- I would definitely be at like maybe a four or a five. Right. I would still be a little on edge and making sure everything's all right. I'd still be learning from it, but it wouldn't be as a big of as big of an ordeal anymore. Right. Yeah. No, I'm with you. So well that's awesome. <laughs> um that's all the time we have for today. But we're going to leave you with this last challenge, okay? I think that anytime you want to see change in your classroom and anytime you want to see growth in your classroom, you have to start with yourself, right? Don't ever ask your kids to do something you're not willing to do. So we're going to challenge you this week that you look look over the course of your week and and pick one activity that's going to push you personally out of your comfort zone to that six to seven range where you know you're going to have to struggle through it and then I want you to consider the lessons that you learn after you accomplish it. I think that if we do that personally, it starts to give us an awesome perspective and framework for how we can start doing this in our class. So we would love for you to write to us, or, well, I guess we don't really write anymore. We type. That was, like, really old school. Yeah. We want you to send us an email, right? <laughs> so our email address is info at teach bigger, and uh, we'd love to hear h- how you're challenging yourself and what, what the outcome is, and, and we love your feedback. So, again, that's info at Teach Bigger. So, thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to picking up our discussion and and hearing from you again. Yeah.